Thank you. Thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us. Um, I'm Sandy Stanhope, the Chief Learning Officer here at All Learners, and I get to share this, this, the spotlight a little bit with John Tapper, the founder and CEO of All Learners. And so our goal this afternoon is to share with you um, some ideas um, and maybe investigating a little bit about the support systems we need to have in place for intervention to actually um, be orchestrated to benefit students. Okay, folks, so... Um... Lily DePino, welcome. So um, what we're gonna do here is we're, we have a presentation for you. Um, there are a lot of people here, but not a prohibitive amount. So um, what we wanna do is if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat, I'll ask Carly since she's here, if you could um, keep track of those so we can bring them up. Um, our goal is that this is useful for you. We are going to um, we are going to focus a little bit for leaders. Uh, so there, there is not as much information about practitioners, but everything that we do is geared toward the practitioner. So one of the things that makes All Learners Network different, I think, is that we are really down in the weeds when it comes to math instruction, particularly instruction for anybody that's having difficulty with mathematics. So in everything we do, there's always mathematics and there's always attention to particular techniques for what goes on between students and teachers, because in the end, that's what makes the difference. Okay, hopefully you've all got a chance to take a look at that QR code or the link. Uh, that little padlet that I put together has lots and lots of information, not just on the leadership aspect of, uh, of this presentation, but on all kinds of things related to intervention. All right. Okay. And all right, this is, I get to, I get to talk a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is, so this is all learners mission. We really, and you might may have heard this, um, Ashley shared a little bit in the in Dr. Nikki's keynote, but our mission is to be able to cultivate a community of educators that promote math equity and inclusion for all students. And in order for us to get there, we or why we believe that, we believe that learning math is a right for every student because so much of their future success, their future relies on that and it depends on it. And every child, every student deserves a skillful math teacher. And one our part of our work this afternoon is that we're going to discuss the ways in which systems can support all students to have access to really important mathematics. Okay, John. Uh, I just want to add that when we say all, we mean all. Occasionally, I reference Charlotte. Who knows who Charlotte is? But there, there's often when you're thinking about all, there's a little exclusion. And yeah, but that kid in the wheelchair that has a communication board, I mean, you're not really, yeah, we want to be really clear. We mean absolutely everyone. So our mission is to cultivate this community of educators. And why? Um, because we are always, always thinking about how do we continue to focus in on math and have an equity lens as we're doing that. So we think about the, the mathematics, how do we focus, I'm just going to let you to read this. We focus on access to excellent math instruction for all students because it creates opportunities for higher levels of learning and better lives. And so we are, building a network of capable, confident math learners as we um, envelop all of the, the, the people who work with students. All right, John. All Learners is devoted to these five, three or five key concepts. We believe in high leverage concepts. We're gonna talk more about them this afternoon. It's the minimum foundational mathematical understandings that students need to be successful in the following year of school. We'll talk more. We have a particular 
style of, uh, of or our format for our math lessons. It's a work sti workshop style. We believe that it, it allows for inclusion and differentiation, and it has four main components, a launch section, a main lesson, math menu, which provides choice and individualization and just right um, opportunities for learning. And we believe that every lesson needs to have a closure. In order for us to create those really meaningful lessons, we have to know how students think in order to plan that really effective instruction. And it's ongoing, it's an ongoing cycle of improvement. As we look at their work, we plan accordingly, we make adjustments, and we plan accordingly. It is a, a cycle of learn teaching and learning. All learners, coaches, and facilitators try new practices. They revise the tools, we revise the tools, and adjust the techniques that we use in order for all students to make progress. And we share those results. We are a dynamic group of people who are working with teachers and students, and we're trying out ways that make math accessible. One of the reasons you're here today is because we really believe that instructional leaders um, play an important part. So we want to work with systems and develop, develop some pedagogical skill and use of assessment so that instruction becomes even more um, deliberate, intentional, again, so that all students access math. So it's really hard for us to talk at people for any length of time, not because it's not fun, but because, you know, it's not very engaging for you. So we're going to break you into groups. Um, what's the count for participants at this point? We have 38 people. 38 people. Okay, so let's put you in groups of maybe seven. We're going to give you a couple of minutes. We'll send out a response. But we want you to think about what are the biggest challenges for students, what are the biggest challenges for intervention? And let's see, uh, we'll call you back in a few minutes. Okay, thanks folks. Um, so four things that we can do. Um, we need to focus on the most important concept. So when all learners got started, um, we were talking about What's the thing that someone needs to know and be able to do to be successful in the next grade? And we vetted these now with thousands of teachers. Thing is, when you talk about priority standards or power standards, everybody has some horse in the race. And what we were trying to boil this down to is, what are the things that actually matter the most, right? So if a kindergartner doesn't know about shapes, it's not good. You want a complete curriculum to have geometry in it, but it's not, doesn't have the same impact on their success in fourth in first grade as what they'll know about numbers to 20. So we've created this system called the high leverage concepts. They're available for free on the website. They're posted on the Padlet. You should absolutely take these away. And if you're talking about special education intervention, uh, special educators and interventionists love the high leverage concepts because it tells them what's most important. And by what's most important, I mean, has the most measurable impact. In addition to being important in the next year, if you pay attention to these high leverage concepts, you're going to see changes in measurable outcomes. Um, the system that articulates clear short-term goals, we're going to talk about that. Dr. Nikki talked about that supports professional growth for learning specialists. Okay, so this is this is a, a thing that's really big on my mind. And somebody in the, one of the groups also mentioned it. Special educators particularly have almost universally not had enough math content, like usable math content, deconstructed math content that they need to support kids. And then finally, if we had a bumper sticker that, or a banner, we, we would say focus more on strategies than you do on answers. So John, you just really shared, we do focus in on the most important concepts. And, and, and actually you can go to the next slide. 
one of the, the questions that we actually, we get so often is from special educators, from interventionists, there are so many standards. There are so many things that, that our students have to know. How, what do we choose? How do we choose? And so from all of the conversations, as John said, we, we want to think about what's the thing we want to hang our hat on that we know, that we absolutely know the students will need to, to continue to make progress in the next year. And so we have what we call high leverage concept maps, and they contain um, a progression of how students build really important essential mathematics that will, that will allow them to achieve access to algebra. And so what you see, and you can, and John uh, shared these on the Padlet, what you see here are maps, and I'm sharing this slide, and you'll see one on the on the next slide that John brings up, is just the span of grade levels from pre-K pre to grade two. And as you look at these maps, we highlight the most important idea. And so for pre-K and, and kindergarten, we're looking at number sense. We're thinking about how what children will need in order to be successful. What's the most important math? We move into first and second grade and we're thinking about additive reasoning. When we move into third and fourth grade, we're thinking about multiplicative reasoning and then fractional reasoning. We're really zeroing in on what's so most, the most essential. When we, we've, and we've pared down the, the, the concept we want in intervention to focus on. If you only have 20 minutes, what should you focus on? What's gonna give you, what will benefit students most? And these are the pieces that will benefit students most. So as you look at that first row, you can see clearly articulated concepts, content that we want students to understand, that we can build on. We also know over so many years of working with teachers in classrooms, thinking about what works, what doesn't work, what will have impact. We, we really know that there are some models that have better or benefit students better during intervention and during instruction. And we've articulated those. So why choose other models or why go down the windy road of models that really will not illuminate the most important mathematics? We also know that there are some critical strategies that we have to provide opportunities for students to muck around with. And when we're thinking about those in, for number, we're thinking about counting. Counting, 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 subitizing and organizing and, and tracking big quantities, small quantities, comparing quantities. When we move into additive reasoning at the heart of, of compose at, at the heart of addition and subtraction is composing and decomposing. How do we compose numbers? How do we decompose them so that they are numbers that work for me? And my numbers, the way I decompose and compose may not work for you, but you are allowed the opportunity to discover those. So we highlight those, those particular strategies that not only are important for the grade level in which students find themselves, but also build towards the next grade level. The same thing for those models that we are sharing with you in our maps. And so John has the pre-K to grade two map. John, if you had hit the button. I would, I wanna make one quick comment so that it doesn't get lost. No algorithms. Uh, so, so I know like there's a lot of people in here. So at least one person wants to argue with me about that. Here's the thing, or, or people wanna say, even Pam Harris and I went back and forth about this. People wanna say, well, there comes a point when, no. So what we know from our work in the field is if you stop teaching the subtraction algorithm, you will reduce the number of children in intervention. The subtraction algorithm particularly and division actually confuses children. It does not help them. And for classrooms that never abandoned it, they frequently only have 50% of their kids who are able to compute with any kind of accuracy and understanding. So no algorithms that you're better off without them. And you'll see that same statement um, as we move into grades three and grades four and grade five. Our belief is that we want children to be sense makers, 
and algorithms don't necessarily support, don't support, not necessarily don't support that. Again, the model, the map for the high leverage concept is very similar. We continue the format so that we know exactly what the most important um, math is that we want, that we know students, we can hang our hats on and know that our students are actually um, well situated for the next grade level. The models create a progression um, or our map creates a progression for the models and the critical strategies. What we just saw in additive reasoning for composing and decomposing numbers during an additive situation, we also see those same strategies being used and developed when we start thinking about multiplicative um, strategies. So out of all of this work, teachers said, oh, I love this. This is really helpful. I can zero in. But how do I actually orchestrate or create a, a, a learning plan for my students that I can use during an intervention group? And so in addition to the high leverage concepts, the ALN team with lots of input from teachers, from, from um, the variety of teachers we work with across the, um, the schools with which we work, helped us to create or think about the trajectory of learning and opportunities and models when they're crafting instruction. And so this is part of the first grade HLC, the high leverage concept. We want students to understand place value when adding and subtracting numbers within 100. And so you see that highlighted in that circle. We also know that when, we're, when we want children to build that, there are certain models that actually will benefit students. So you can see the, the progression of how we build from single numbers within 10 to numbers that now um, embrace our place value based 10 system and how we can actually use those models to help students to discover and for us to illuminate some of the relationships that will actually benefit students so they can attain the high leverage concept. We use these to, to actually write short-term goals for children. And those goals are very, very tailored to some assessments that we give so that we can find out where students actually fall on this progression. And there we go. And John, I'm gonna hand it to you. Yeah, so um, what we thought we'd throw in here again, so that you got a sense of this, leaders and teachers who are here, is what the process looks like for intervention. Because unfortunately, lots of places that do intervention identify a kid as an intervention kid, right? And we want kids to cycle through intervention. We do not want to see the same kids all the time. Um, there is a variety of reasons that I'm sure you could tell me about why that's a terrible idea. So we identify a, a specific focused goal over a period of four to six weeks. And this comes, all this stuff comes from a school where I was working as an interventionist not that long ago. Um, and so we decided on uh, a simple uh, assessment about both fluency for facts to 20 and strategies. And I know your upper grade teachers are going to complain about doing interview assessments, but really, if strategies are more important than answers, you have to be able to ask a student, what were you thinking when you said this? So when we first started rolling these out, the teachers would say, well, how do I score this? And how many points do they get if they do? The, the points are be beside the question. You want to know about student thinking. Because Nikki was absolutely right that you, you don't fix what they don't know. You build on what they do know. So you have to know what they know. So, you know, this is a fairly obvious 10-frame addition activity. Will kids move the four from one frame to the other? Do they see that in their heads? And in the second, what strategies will they use to add these numbers? Will they make two fives? Will they use double sixes? Will they use double sevens? Will they take some from one to the other? We wanna know about all that. So we give them an assessment that offers us some information. 
Okay, then, and this was done in a school that had seven or eight uh, second grades. Actually, Carly would know that, but I, <laughs> we don't really need to know. Um, so this is just a little snapshot. So after doing the assessment, we were looking for which kids in this round are going to need some support. So if we were pretty sure a kid was going to need support, we, we color-coded them orange. If we wanted to check back, we color-coded them yellow. And notice there's no score here. We just made very, very quick notes. Because again, I would agree with Nikki. If you make this elaborate, people won't do it. It has to be something that can be done quickly. So we went back to all the yellow kids, me as the math interventionist, the special educators, and the classroom teachers, and tried to ascertain who really needs support for these strategies to 20. And, you know, basically who's been memorizing or doesn't know. And then um, generally there are three responsibilities that come up here. And I, I wanna make a real point for you leaders out there. The interventionist is gonna take some of those kids to work with during math class. This is all tier two based. They're gonna work with these kids during math class the special educator will also work with the students in the classroom during math class. And then the classroom teacher has to take a piece of this pie. So every time we identify students with needs, the whole team is taking part in that process. That's very, very important because one of the things that happens, I know you know this, is that when a kid has difficulty, especially if it's tier three, the notion in the teacher's head is not my responsibility. Somebody else has to take care of it. It's the special educator's job. All the kids are the classroom teacher's responsibility. And there are people who are working with them to make this all happen. And then finally, we had a quick example of progress monitoring. I think my overall reason for including this is just, it's not elaborate, it's not complicated. We are just checking in to see if kids demonstrate understanding. For me personally, if a kid can show understanding, real understanding, not just an answer, two days in a row, they come out of whatever extra support I'm doing with them during math menu. Oh, great. So <laughs> math content is really interesting. There's been a lot of research about mathematical content knowledge for teaching. Uh, Deborah Ball and Heather Hill and Ed Silver and a whole bunch of people have written a lot about this. But the idea is it's not enough to be able to do elementary math, right? You went through elementary school, you did the math. That doesn't mean you can teach it. And in fact, even up to the high school level, um, teachers who are secondary teachers, it doesn't really make them better teachers to give them classes like linear algebra and analysis and topology what makes them better high school teachers is if they dig deeper into algebra and geometry and trigonometry and to some degree calculus. So if we take a skillful sixth grade teacher and we move her down to second grade, it's going to be a year or two before she can get the same level of results because she doesn't understand second grade math, even though it's simpler. Okay, so... I promised you some math. So here's what I want you to do. What does it mean one and three quarters divided by a half? This is a famous problem. Also, Nikki referenced Li Ping Ma, 1990, uh, Fundamental Mathematics, really good book. So I want you to think in your head, what would be a word problem? We're not going to share these. <laughs> Had terrible experience with that. Think about a word problem that would require one and three quarters divided by a half to solve. Just, again, you don't have to write it down, just think about it. Give you a second for that. Okay. Now, a lot of you, maybe the majority of you, I don't know, you're math specialists, so who knows? But when I've done this with large groups of teachers, overwhelmingly, people will say something like this. I'm going to use pizza. I actually hate pizza as a model, 
but I'm going to use pizza because fractions, right? Pizza. You have one and three quarters pizzas and you divide them in half. A lot of you were thinking that. Oh, good. I see a couple of you nodding. Very good. Right? Because what we're actually asking is how many halves are in one and three quarters. In Li Ping Ma's study of American teachers, 90 of them with master's degrees in teaching mathematics, not a single one of them, not one, came up with an accurate word problem to describe one and three quarters divided by a half. Their Chinese counterparts, which was the point of her study, half of whom did not have bachelor's degrees, all had ways to offer a word problem for that equation because meaning was really important to them. If you give American fifth and sixth graders a page of division and multiplication problems, uh, equations to solve, they can do that fine. But where they've fallen down for 50 years is distinguishing when they're dividing and when they're multiplying fractions. One other quick story about this bottom here. I was down in Maryland working with some teachers and we were visiting a classroom and there was a group of boys and the teacher put this equation in front of them, one and three quarters divided, one and one third times three quarters. And one of the boys gave her a kind of side eye. And he says, that's not a very interesting problem. And she said, why isn't that an interesting problem? And he says, well, you've got three quarters and you want a third of them. It's just a quarter. And what was fascinating to me at that moment was I know that every adult I had been with either canceled the threes or multiplied across the top and got three twelves. But none of them were thinking, well, I'm making three quarters into three equal pieces, so each one has to be a quarter. That's the difference between a procedural understanding of how to work with fractions, usually related to the algorithm, and a deep understanding of that content. For people to be effective with students, they need this deep understanding. <clears throat> Okay, I think this means questions. <laughs> John, there were a few things in the chat. Now is now a good time to bring yeah, some. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Yes. Um, one of them was uh, from Emily. She asked if there's research that shows the benefit of interventionists pushing into the classroom versus pulling kids out during math. Um, sure, there's lots of inclusion uh, literature there's a sort of dual effect right you have to sort of separate well what's the math improvement effect and then what's the effect on the child you know because when you're taking a kid out of the classroom there's a very clear message i also i'm going to get in trouble for this but why not i want to really caution you about the research thing especially because i'm talking to a room full of school leaders here my team is now going oh dear he's going to do that so I am an ed researcher. I've taught research methods. I've published a book and papers and studies. This is social science, not physics. And Marilyn Burns, for those of you who know her incredible amount of work, will say, look, for every study you're going to pull out, I can pull out a study that contradicts it. Okay, that doesn't mean research is worthless. It doesn't. But you have to understand that research is just an argument or a story. And you have to evaluate whether it works. I could do some really, really fancy statistics. But if I build the statistical model and I don't see it in the classroom, I don't believe it. Right? This is, again, what makes all learners all learners is everything we do, we've used a design research approach to test in the classrooms. And we know that it works. So, yes. Inclusion will work. We believe you need a balance. We think all the work should be done together because of the social message it sends, because of the equity message it sends. But um, we believe there's a time when everybody works together on grade level math, just like Nikki was saying. And then there's a time in the lesson when everybody gets just right math. 
when some kids are challenged, when some kids are circling back to things they're not clear about. You have to have both of those components in the lesson if it's going to mean all learners. Do you want to add to that, Sandy? No, I, I think you captured it. <laughs> other questions? John, there was one other, well, people did want to argue with you about the algorithm. I know, they um, always do. And, and a few folks uh, were just saying they can, it's easier for them to get behind multiple methods than to agree to no algorithm. Uh, and just kind of getting behind some of that understanding around that it probably is an insufficient understanding of place value, which is leading to that struggle. Did you want to, would you speak more about that? A few people were agreeing with that idea. So, so strategies are more important than answers does not mean the teacher shows the kids five different strategies and then the kids choose the one that's best for them. That is not what that means. The student must construct their own understanding. Must. If, if you don't want fake math, then the student must construct their own understanding. No one constructs the algorithm. Right. So the algorithm, let me make a plea here. It's an anachronism. Right. We don't ride horses anymore. We have indoor plumbing. The algorithm existed at a certain point in time to solve equations quickly and efficiently. They're in the calculator. They actually put the, it took the algorithms out of the schools and put them in the calculator. And so if what you want is computational accuracy, anybody who actually does math for a living, and I've asked many, many professionals about this, will use a calculator for that. What's more important is, can a kid, who's, can a kid do 12 times 15 in their head when they're in fourth grade, right? Mental math estimation is what kids need fluency with not the algorithm. And the division algorithm, I know I got a room full of people here. It's a hot mess. Don't do that ever. And dead monkey smelt, like trying to get kids to memorize a series of nonsensical steps. Like all you have to do is think about sharing problems or partial quotients. Like the actual meaningful division is so much better than the algorithm. And I can't, I've lost track of the number of intervention sessions and special education sessions where the teacher's trying to get the kid to memorize some McDonald's thing or monkeys or whatever with that. The kids still don't know what they're doing. Whereas if, I, if I'm dividing 413 by three, I can just ask the question again. I'm going to reference Nikki on. I can just ask the question. How do I share 413 things among three people? Like my, I've dealt with more sixth grade boys about this particular issue. I don't know why, it's just my experience. I, I, I'm sure girls also have this issue. But they draw the three circles and they start divvying up the 413. And it makes sense to them. Parents freak out because it doesn't look like the long division they know about. But the student understands what division is. And when they come across it in context or in word problems or in science, they recognize it. So Ken, I, I would like to add to this. So I, I'm gonna bring us back to the high leverage concept maps. And so what you see in the critical strategies is, is composition and decomposition of number as the strategy where students actually own the power or have the power actually to pull numbers apart in ways that make sense to them to manipulate numbers so that that algorithm is almost it is unnecessary because they've made sense of the way numbers interact with each other relate to each other and how those operations relate to each other if we give them time to make sense we rush towards something that in most cases is totally unnecessary because children become efficient when they own the strategy and they don't have to make sense of somebody else's. So that's the reason that those critical strategies are illuminated on our map. Um, it really does benefit every single student because they rely on their own sense-making and they build power from that. 
Sandy, yeah. can I add to that too? I, I, I would add to that. When you look at the high leverage concept maps, there a lot of those strategies also iterate through additive reasoning into multiplicative reasoning into fractional reasoning. So there's this smaller conceptual leap that kids have to make when they're transitioning to different operations or different types of numbers because they're carrying these models and strategies and making connections between the operations through those models and strategies, which are highlighted in those documents too. Yeah, Norma posted something about timed assessments. So incredibly here in Vermont, somebody recently came through and says, what did they actually call it? It's a myth. It's a mathematical myth that time tests, there's no empirical evidence that time tests are related to math anxiety. Okay, so my in my life, I try not to be a jerk as much as I possibly can. But I center a page of research studies that directly linked time test to math anxiety. And that's one of those things where like, of course they do. Like, do you really need someone to do a research study that says, okay, come on, let's get that done. It's not going to create anxiety in someone who's not fluent. Like, this is one of the places where I get, you know, there's, there's a massive amount of research that shows, I am not making this up, that better teachers get good outcomes with students. Like somebody spent couple million dollars working on that particular question. Now, it's interesting to do empirically, but clearly we all know that, yeah? And so I would say in 10 years time, this notion that the algorithm is where we're headed, it's going to be the same thing, right? It's just one of those artifacts of doing math the way we did it when we were younger that people don't let go to. But you could take this back to your school and you could decrease the number of students in intervention if you stop teaching that algorithm. And your teachers know what else to do. I mean, if you just say, stop doing that, and they don't have any other moves, right. Science of Math website. Yeah, that's one of those. It's a Canadian website. Who, who threw that up there, Lorraine? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I know. And I, it's a head scratcher. And, you know, I, when I, someone posted a slide from one of my talks, stop teaching the algorithm. Like, what are things that you can do post pandemic? Give more math content PD to your specialists. Stop teaching the algorithm. And suddenly I was in the midst of the sewer pit that is social media about this issue. And, you know, I, I tried really hard to engage and be thoughtful and, it's I I'm old. So, you know, if there's any other old people in on this call, maybe there's one or two, you can relate to that feeling. But um, I'm telling you in the classroom, particularly subtraction and division and God forbid, all of the fraction algorithms, because in intervention, when you teach those fraction algorithms, when they get to seventh and eighth grade, me or somebody else is going to have to untangle them. Oh, and that starts with fifth grade teachers getting some real good professional learning about what fraction work actually looks like. Am I correct that we have a 530 cutoff? Yes, you are, sir. Okay, so here's, here's what we're going to do. First of all, be, oh yeah, there were other things on there I was supposed to do, weren't there? Yeah, no, okay. Um, I'm the CEO of a company and I'm the one that has to be reminded all the time about the stuff we're supposed to do. So anyway, All Learners Network is a company that does professional learning in schools and districts. We have an online platform. We really can make help your school, help your teachers be the heroes of this story. We can help you make a difference. And in schools where we work, there are dramatic changes. Sometimes we even get tears about people telling us about the changes that have happened in their schools. So we would love to work with all of you. Um, what I'm going to say now is that the ALN people will hang out for another 10 or 15 minutes. For any of you that want to visit or talk or tell me why algorithms are a good idea, I'm happy to listen. I'm, I'm not that arrogant. Um, 
We'd love to talk to you, but I'm glad that you came today. I hope that you'll come to the other sessions that we're offering. We are really trying to change math and instruction in the United States, and we'd love for you to help us do that. Thank you. Thank you for spending this part of your afternoon with us. And please check us out. I put in the I put a link to our website in the chat. Um, we'd love to have more conversations with you.